Good singing. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, this morning we have a wonderful privilege to have uh, one of my favorite preachers preach this morning. And I, I'm not kidding, I'm not trying to flatter. Uh, Dr. Harmon is a professor at Grace College and Theological Seminary. He's the New Testament. And there you go, I see that, Ethan. Yeah, Gracie's got to represent, right? So um, that's where I went, Kelsey went, Ethan went, a few other people in here, uh, even go right now. Uh, we're grateful for Dr. Harmon and his work uh, for the church. Uh, he's a member at Christ's Covenant over in Warsaw, and so uh, he skipped teaching Sunday school today to come and preach for us this morning. I'm really grateful for that. Um, Dr. Harmon really loves the book of Philippians. In fact, he wrote a commentary that's really, really good about it. And so it's a privilege to be able to have him come and preach this morning from Philippians. And so I am so grateful that he's here. And um, also, I do know that the preaching is going to be better this morning because Ohio State won yesterday. All right. <laughs> so uh, he's an Ohio State fan. Maybe that's a bad thing for you, but uh, let's... Uh, Welcome him this morning, all right? Thank you, Chase. It is a privilege to be with you this morning. Um, one of the great privileges of being a professor at Grace is the opportunity to mentor students. And I still remember very clearly the first time I met Chase. He and his dad were visiting and, and checking out to see if Grace would be a good place for, for, for Chase to attend. Um, and I remember walking away from that conversation thinking, man, I hope he chooses to come here because he is the kind of student we want at Grace. And little did I know at that point that I would eventually end up getting to mentor Chase to... Um, do the premarital counseling for him and his wife, Kelsey, and uh, end up getting to continue our friendship. And that's one of the great things about being a professor is oftentimes you get to become friends with your students. And his entire family is very dear to me. I, I, I've had multiple connection points with his parents, with his, uh, with his sister. It's just all over the map. We are big fans of the Ringler family. So Chase, thank you for bringing me here this morning. Uh, another great privilege of being at Grace is I get the opportunity to travel internationally a good bit. And over the past probably about 10 years or so, I've had the privilege of traveling to about a dozen or so countries around the world. And on many of those trips, I've been able to take Grace students with me. I love the opportunity to get to expose our students to the, the beauty of God's creation around the world, as well as the challenges that come from being in a foreign culture. And one of the things you realize very quickly when you travel internationally is the value and importance of a passport. Because as you're entering and leaving a country, you need to be able to show where you are ultimately from, where your citizenship is rooted. And if you don't have that passport, you are unlikely to get much of anywhere. And when we talk about citizenship, at one level, we are also talking about our identity. Our citizenship plays a role in shaping who we are, what we value, and what we find important to us. So as we open the book of Philippians this morning, what we're going to see is Paul will address this fundamental issue of citizenship. So I invite you to join me in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. And as you're turning there, it's always good for us to kind of remind ourselves of where we're at in this letter. As Paul writes this, he is under house arrest in Rome, awaiting his hearing before the emperor. And he's already expressed his gratitude for what God has done in the Philippians and their ongoing partnership in the gospel ministry. It would be natural to think that Paul's imprisonment would mean that the gospel has stopped advancing, but Paul makes it clear that the act, actually the opposite has happened. Paul may be in chains, but the gospel is running free 
there in Rome. And although he realizes that his hearing could go south in any number of different ways and that the emperor could decide to have him executed, he actually is convinced that he will continue on in ministry and help the Philippians grow in their love for Christ. And all throughout this first chapter, and really through the entirety of the letter, is this undercurrent that sometimes bubbles up to the surface but is always there underneath of joy, of Paul's unbreakable joy regardless of his circumstances. And that brings us now to our focus text for the morning, Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. I invite you to read along as I read it. Uh, I'll be reading from the ESV translation. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have." So let me be very upfront here. The main point of what Paul is saying in this paragraph is pretty straightforward, and I might summarize it like this. We must live out our citizenship in God's kingdom according to the pattern of the gospel. We must live out our citizenship in God's kingdom according to the pattern of the gospel. So what I'm going to do is unpack that help you see how I get that from the text, and then I'm going to show you how Paul gives us two reasons why it's necessary for us to do that. So, let's start with his main point that we must live out our citizenship in God's kingdom according to the pattern of the gospel. So, here in verse 27, we actually have the first command in the entire letter. Everything else up to this point, Paul has been describing what's been happening to him. He's been talking about how he prays for the Philippians. And now, finally, in verse 27, he issues his first command. And this command is actually so important that he says, only let your manner of life. Or as the NIV translates it, whatever happens, live this way. In effect, Paul is saying, this is really the only thing necessary. This command really serves as the thesis statement for the entire letter of the uh, entire main body of the letter that runs all the way into chapter 4. So that entire section is about living as kingdom citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, at this point, some of you might be scratching your head and saying, okay, Matt, um, you keep using the language of kingdom and citizenship, and I don't see that in my text. Where are you getting that from? Well, it's true. Most English translations have something like, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If you happen to be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, they render it, though, as, as citizens of heaven live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And even if you're reading out of the English Standard Version as I am, if you note, there is a little footnote there that tells you at the bottom of the page that this could also be translated, only behave as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's because Paul is using a very specific word that doesn't just mean live in some generalized sense, but actually means to live as a citizen. And it's related to the word that Paul is going to use later in chapter 3. So if you flip over to chapter 3, verse 20, towards the end of this main letter section, look at what Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, one way we could put this is, that, is to say that in Philippians 1.27, 
In essence, Paul is saying, only citizen in a manner worthy of the gospel to help us see the connection to later in chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. Now, of course, just by itself, you, won't, you don't necessarily know when he says citizenship, where is he talking about? Because, of course, in the original context, being a Roman citizen was a really big deal. It was kind of the, the, the prized status that one could have. But even in a city like Philippi, which wasn't very large, maybe at most 40% of the population would have been citizens. So when, when, when Paul is drawing on this citizenship language, he is trying to lift our eyes to say, ultimately it doesn't matter where your earthly citizenship is, what matters most is where your citizenship is in heaven. Because all who trust in Christ have the privilege of being citizens of God's kingdom, with our true home being the new Jerusalem that is currently in heaven. Now, as followers of Christ, one of the most important things we need to remember that this text reminds us of is that this world is not our home. And yet, I think because we live in a great country like the U.S., and oftentimes we live relatively comfortable lives, it can be easy for us to begin to think that this world is our home. But friends, that's not how Scripture describes us as believers. We are exiles or pilgrims or even sojourners. We are on our way to the heavenly city that God has made for us Yet we live in this fallen world that is racing full speed towards God's terrifying judgment. But our status as citizens of God's kingdom doesn't mean, on the other side, that we just sort of embrace this kind of bunker mentality where we're like, well, we just got to hold on until Jesus comes back and, and just try to brace ourselves and isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. God intends for us as the church to be an outpost of His kingdom here in this fallen world, a place where God's rule and His reign can be readily seen by the way that we as the church live in community with one another. <clears throat> now, when you travel to a foreign country, it's always helpful to know where the American embassy is located. And although that embassy is physically located in a foreign country, the property itself is actually a piece of American soil in the midst of that foreign land. That embassy exists to represent the interests of the U.S. And once inside those gates, the laws and the values of the U.S. are what matter most. There is a sense in which we as the church are intended to be an embassy of God's heavenly kingdom placed right in the middle of this fallen world. And as we participate in God's mission in this world, there is a sense in which we should be able to say to people, do you want a taste of God's kingdom? Come experience life in the church. Come experience life in the church. We should be able to say, if you want to see what God's kingdom looks like in tangible ways, come experience life in the local church. Now, just like with any country, citizens of God's kingdom have certain responsibilities and privileges. We are to live, according to this text, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So just as the Constitution is what governs our country, the gospel is what governs our lives as Christians. The gospel is not just how we initially become a Christian and then we sort of like move on to other stuff. The gospel is the means by which we continue to live the Christian life on an everyday basis. And you might wonder, well, how, how can the gospel govern our lives? Well, it can because it's the gospel of 
Christ. It's the good news about who Jesus is and what He has done for us. It's the good news that Jesus lived the life of perfect obedience that we could not live and died the death that we deserved to die for our sins and rose on the third day to defeat our greatest enemies of sin, death, and the devil. And all of us who have entered the kingdom of God through faith in Christ must live in a manner that is consistent with, that reflects the way that Christ our King actually lived Himself, a point that Paul is going to go on to make later in this text in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So, that's the main point of this paragraph. We must live our citizenship in God's kingdom according to the pattern of the gospel. Now, in the rest of this paragraph, Paul is going to give us two reasons why that's necessary. And the first is found in the second half of verse 27, stretching on into verse 28, and I'll summarize it like this. Opposition to the gospel threatens to knock us off balance. Opposition to the gospel threatens to knock us off balance. Paul was deeply invested in the spiritual growth of the Philippians, regardless of whether he was with them or not. And he wants to hear a report back that regardless of what's going on in his life or even in the Philippians' life, that they are standing firm in one spirit. You see that phrase there in verse 27. He wants to hear that you are standing firm in one spirit. Spirit. And that's an important phrase, so I want to take a moment to unpack that. Paul loves that expression of stand firm when he's describing how we as Christians should live. And the imagery that he's probably drawing on is the picture of Roman soldiers digging in, to use a modern analogy, like an offensive line in football, forming a protective wall around the quarterback so he can throw the ball. Now, later in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul is going to talk about standing firm in the Lord. Here, however, he calls us to stand firm in the Spirit. Now, I recognize that in most of our English Bibles, there's probably a lowercase s on that word spirit. But I actually believe that when you read the text and study it carefully, Paul is instead referring to the Holy Spirit, that it should be a capital S there, that we as believers stand firm in the Holy Spirit, in God's Spirit, because God has not left us on our own to stand firm. He's given us the Spirit of God to unite us as believers to stand firm together. So what does it look like to stand firm in the Spirit Paul gives us both a positive picture and a negative picture. First, the positive. Standing firm in the Spirit means striving together for greater gospel-produced faith. Did you see that there? Look again at verse 27. Standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul is again using athletic imagery here. He's using the same kind of imagery that he uses in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, when he writes, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes or strives according to the rules. Now, my apologies, this sermon feels a little heavy on football illustrations, so my apologies if that doesn't connect with you, but I think you can understand the point even if you don't care at all about football. The point is... Every player on a football team or any sports team in general has to work in unison and according to the rules in order for a play to succeed. All it takes is one player, one player to violate the rules, and it doesn't matter how well the other 10 did on the play, one player messes up and it nullifies that play. And so the picture that comes out of this is that we need to strive together as fellow believers for 
the faith of the gospel, as the ESV puts it. Or to put it another way, faith produced by the gospel. So in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul writes that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So as we hear the gospel preached and taught and applied, and as we read it, the Spirit of God produces and deepens our faith in Christ. But I want to be clear that that happens in the context of community. Now, I'm not downplaying the importance of individual and personal study and meditation and reading of the text. That is fundamental to the Christian life. But Paul is stressing here that we must be in community, striving together. And as I get older, you can judge whether I'm actually falling into that category of old or not really old. Probably depends on how old you are as you make that assessment. But the older I get, the more I appreciate the value of living in close community within the body of Christ. And I fear that too many of us have fooled ourselves into thinking that because maybe we're connected loosely with a lot of different people on social media or maybe loosely in our neighborhood or in other contexts, that we are more connected than we actually are. I'm not talking about connecting with people to the point where it's just like, yeah, let's talk some weather and some sports and just kind of, you know, surface level stuff. I'm talking about the kind of community where you share with another person the things you're struggling with, your frustrations, your disappointments, and your joys. And you enter into their life as well to hear what they're struggling with, what they're rejoicing in, how they're trusting the Lord. Areas that you can help them, encourage them. Friends, we all need that kind of biblical community. We need it. We, by nature here in the U.S., tend to be the sort of rugged individualist types. I can just do this on my own, just me and Jesus in my Bible. That's not the picture of the Christian life that the Bible gives us. We need each other. We need to be in community with one another. We need to be striving together with one another to encourage faith to grow and deepen in one another's lives. So that's the positive picture of what it looks like to stand firm in the Spirit. Now here's the negative picture. That comes later actually in verse 28 where Paul writes, "...and not frightened in anything by your opponents." This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. So, standing firm in the Spirit means not being intimidated by gospel opponents. Now, this is the first time that Paul indicates he's not the only one facing opposition to the gospel, that in fact the, uh, the Philippians are, are facing some kind of resistance, of opposition. And there's no indication that they're being jailed or thrown into prison at this point, but it does seem like they're probably experiencing some sort of persecution maybe on the economic front or being excluded from certain parts of society. They are suffering at some level for the sake of Christ. It's real and something that Paul takes seriously. But standing firm in the Spirit means not being frightened by it. That doesn't mean we feel no fear, but what it does mean is that we don't allow fear to dictate our actions. That's a key distinction. That word that Paul uses there to describe being frightened is used elsewhere in Greek literature to refer to horses being startled in battle. So you can kind of picture that in your brain of of horses suddenly freaking out and panicking and throwing their riders and just running chaotically wherever. Paul says, you know that picture? Yeah, don't be like that. That's essentially what he's saying. Even in the face of opposition to the gospel, we need to stand firm in the power of the Spirit. And I have to be honest... I see far too many people today who claim the name of Christ, 
who are completely dominated by fear, utterly controlled by fear. And it doesn't matter if it's politics or if it's COVID or cultural issues or anything else, far too many believers are acting as if the cause of Christ is going to be utterly doomed if their preferred candidates or policies don't come to fruition. Friends, that's simply not true. God has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against His church. And history has demonstrated that God often advances the gospel even in the face of intense persecution. So even if everything you fear most happens here in this country, God will continue to build His church. The gospel will advance. God will build His church through the faithful proclamation of the gospel and through our self-sacrificial love of one another. That is unshakable and makes no difference who is in power or what policies are put in place. We can count on that. We can't put our hopes in transforming this culture or getting just the right people in place. That's fool's gold, ultimately. And here I think it's appropriate for us to remember that although we as believers here in the United States have largely been exempt from significant opposition and hostility to the gospel, though I believe that is beginning to change for sure, there are countless brothers and sisters around the world who risk their lives by simply identifying themselves as a follower of Jesus. That the very act of showing up for worship on a Sunday morning somewhere could be the last thing that they do because of government persecution or whatever else. My wife and I have been especially burdened this past month for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, and it was encouraging to hear Chase pray for the church there, church elsewhere. Friends, oftentimes our perspective on the body of Christ is so <clears throat> localized that we lose sight of the fact that we have brothers and sisters around the world who are in grave danger of their lives simply for claiming to follow Jesus. And I don't say that to make us feel guilty. I say that to make us pray. I say that to make us long to find ways that we can encourage them and pray for them and support them. We have so much to learn from our brothers and sisters around the world when they face that kind of persecution. There are times where I will hear about believers facing these kinds of life or death situations in dark places. And I will say to my wife, only partly joking, when I hear people talk like that, sometimes I wonder if I'm even a Christian. Like I think, look at what they're willing to risk to follow Jesus. I've never been called to risk that. Now, I know I am a Christian. I love Jesus. I put my trust in Him. But it makes me pause and think, look at how much it's costing that person to follow Jesus. I think one of the most comforting truths we can cling to, even in the midst of opposition, regardless of what degree of opposition we might face, is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, where he writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? When we stand firm in the face of opposition to the gospel, it is a tangible sign that we are in fact God's covenant people set apart for mission in this world as we make our way to our heavenly home. But it's also a sign to our opponents that unless they turn away from their sin, they too will face eternal destruction, which path are you on this morning? So standing firm in the Spirit enables us to face opposition 
in the, uh, to the gospel without being knocked off balance. That's the first reason. The second reason that we need to live out our citizenship in God's kingdom according to the pattern of the gospel is that suffering shows the surpassing value of Christ. Suffering shows the surpassing value of Christ. Now, when Paul says that both faith and suffering are things that God graciously grants to us, we might do a double take. So let me point you back into the text again. Look with me at verse 29, where Paul writes, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Now, when we hear that God gives those two gifts, we think, well, I'll gladly take the gift of faith. Yes, sir, can I have some more? But then you get to that second gift, and you see that suffering is a gift. And that's one that we might think, um, can I get a receipt with that one to take that one back? Because that's not one that we eagerly want. And yet, Paul says it is God's gracious gift to us, that it's not just something that God gives, but actually the language He uses is the language that would be used to describe generous individuals giving large sums of money for public works in the community. Even more noteworthy, though, Paul uses this exact same verb in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, when he writes this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And of course, the ultimate example of God's gracious generosity is the gift of his son, Jesus. And based on that gift, what Paul says, if he didn't withhold that from you, Why would you think that he would withhold anything that is good for you ultimately? And that includes, that all things includes, not just faith, but suffering. But we shouldn't run too quickly past this idea that faith is a gift from God. It's absolutely clear that we are responsible to believe in Christ. No one believes for us. And yet, this passage tells us that faith is a gift from God. So, how do we make sense of this? How do we put this together in our brains? Well, let me try to explain it like this. Every single one of us enters this world as a descendant of Adam. We are dead in our sins. And we have this veil over the eyes of our heart But in God's sovereign power, God takes away that veil and makes a person spiritually alive so that when that happens, the natural response is to see the beauty of Christ and respond by trusting in Him. And if you are a follower of Jesus, that's exactly what God has done for you. There was a time when you were dead in your sins and could not see the beauty of Christ. But then at some point, God opened your eyes, and suddenly Jesus became more precious to you than anything or anyone else in this world. What a remarkable gift. Now, of course, it's easy to be grateful for that kind of gift, but it's that second gift that still is just sort of lurking in the text that I'm sure you're thinking, how is suffering a gift? Let's approach it from this angle. We are identified as belonging to Christ by suffering because of Him. See, our faith unites us to Jesus in such a way that we are united to Him, joined with Him. So it should make sense when you consider that if Christ suffered, we who identify with Him will also be called to suffer because we are identified with with Him. Suffering is a gift. But this is a place where we have to make sure that we allow the biblical text 
to determine what we think rather than our natural inclinations and our feelings. Because we, by nature, are going to think, Why, how can suffering be a good thing? Well, let's start with what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. Starting in verse 3, Paul writes, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Suffering is one of the means that God uses to deepen our hope and intensify our love for Him through the work of the Spirit in our lives. And it's one of God's appointed means for making us more like Jesus. Because just later in chapter 2, Paul is going to remind us that we follow a crucified Savior who humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then later in chapter 3, verse 10, Paul expresses his desire as, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection and want to share His sufferings becoming like Him in His death. Now, one final way that suffering for Christ is a gracious gift from God is that it clarifies what's truly important. All the small things in life that we are tempted to get so worked up about and so angry or so frustrated with suddenly fade in importance when we suffer for the sake of Christ. And when we suffer for the sake of Christ, we experience the same kind of struggle that Paul himself experienced. That's the point of what he says in verse 30, that the Philippians are engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. They're saying, he, Paul's saying, you are joining with me in experiencing this reality. And here's where it's helpful to look back and think, okay, so how did Paul think about this? Look back with me at chapter 1, verse 21. I want you to see this in your own Bibles to remind you that in the midst of this situation where Paul is on trial for being a follower of Jesus and he faces the very real prospect of being executed for that, he says in verse 21 of chapter 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As we suffer for the sake of Christ, we will experience that truth in fresh and powerful ways. Brothers and sisters, imagine what it would be like in this local congregation if we embraced our identity as citizens of God's kingdom. And if you're a follower of Christ, your identity is rooted in your citizenship in God's kingdom, first and foremost. That is the most important piece of your identity, is being a citizen of God's kingdom. But for some of you here this morning, if you're honest with yourself, you have become far too comfortable as a citizen of this world. Because your life might feel relatively comfortable, you've lost sight of your status as an exile, as a sojourner, as someone who is passing through this world on your way to your true heavenly home. And if that is you this morning, God is calling you to lift your eyes and see afresh the beauty of Jesus Christ, your King, and to reflect upon your heavenly citizenship. Now, others of you this morning find yourself longing for your heavenly home, but you're trying to live the Christian life on your own. That's not how God intends you to live the Christian life. God saved you to be part of a community of believers. There is no accident that God calls us the body of Christ. We 
need each other. We need to be living in community, striving together for a growing and deepening gospel-produced faith. And if you are not you're not in some form of close Christian community, whether that's a small group, whether that's a close personal friendship with another believer, where you are actually opening up about what is going on in your life and how you need to be prayed for and things you're struggling with, things you're rejoicing about, you desperately need to get that. And the local church is the primary place where you should be looking for that. Perhaps you came in this morning coming off a week where you have experienced some kind of suffering or some kind of persecution because you are a follower of Jesus. And I want to be clear, I'm, this text isn't minimizing this. I mean, Paul is not, yeah, sure, suffering's great. I've never experienced it, but suffering's really great. He is under house arrest. He's had the snot beaten out of him repeatedly for being a follower of Jesus. This is a man who, despite all of that, says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain because he sees the surpassing value of Jesus. Embrace that suffering as a gift from God. And some of you here this morning may not be citizens of God's kingdom. You've never turned from your sins and trusted in Christ to be forgiven. Maybe this morning as God's word is being preached, you've begun to long for that heavenly kingdom. Maybe, just maybe, this kingdom passage has sparked your heart and mind to want to know Jesus, the great King. Friends, in every way that you have failed, King Jesus obeyed. For every sin you've ever committed, Jesus has given His very own life as a substitute for you. For every enemy you have faced or ever will face, Jesus has risen from the dead. Why will you perish in your sins when the great King Jesus opens up His arms and says, come to me and find everlasting life? The great King is offering you terms of peace. Lay down your weapons and surrender to Him before it is too late.